Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about types of evidence. Although not directly related to statistics, it's important to spend a little bit of time thinking about the different forms of scientific evidence and how valid each of these might be. The three types of evidence that we're going to talk about today are the anecdote, observations, and experiments. Anecdotes represent a single or small number of events that are typically attention grabbing or dramatic that cause us to think that there's a relationship that may or may not actually exist. So for example, a pond in your backyard might turn bright green after a rainstorm, and we might be tempted to think that that was caused by the rain. Alternatively, some children begin to develop symptoms of autism following their standard vaccination schedules at an early age. Some parents misattribute this autism to the fact that their child received the vaccine. And many of you are probably well aware of the TikTok video that showed a monkey peeling strings off of a banana that caused many of us to think, oh, I guess monkeys don't like to eat those things either. But these are all representations or examples of anecdotes that represent very poor forms of evidence. So why is the anecdote a poor form of scientific evidence? Well, first of all, anecdotes are highly biased. We hear about the dramatic cases, the attention grabbing cases, but we don't hear about the cases when nothing happened. So we might watch that TikTok video and think that monkeys don't like to eat the strings on bananas. But how many videos have you seen of monkeys eating bananas for which they don't peel off those strings? It's possible that this was an extremely rare and unusual event and that most of the time monkeys don't peel the strings off of bananas when they eat them, but we would never know about that because those sorts of videos are boring and not attention grabbing. So we get a very biased view of patterns in the natural world towards things that are attention grabbing or dramatic. And that's what I mean by cherry picking. When a child develops autism following a vaccination, that's very dramatic to parents who experience that. But for parents whose children don't develop autism following a vaccination, we don't give it much thought. As a result, there's a bias towards the presence of patterns and we have very little, if any, information on the absence of relationships between the two things we might be observing. The second reason that anecdotes represent weak evidence is that they're typically based on a very small number of observations. As a result, we don't really know how general those patterns are. And finally, anecdotes could easily be influenced by other unmeasured factors that we haven't taken into consideration. So for example, the pond in your backyard might turn green because of that particular time in the summer. Temperatures in the pond are warm enough for an algal bloom to emerge, and it might not correspond at all to the particular rain event that had just happened. The second type of evidence that we'll talk about today is observational evidence. In an observational study, the researcher collects data on a sample of subjects but doesn't perform any sort of manipulation on those subjects. So for example, Waite and Strickland measured the proportion of Grey Jay territories in Algonquin Park, Ontario, Canada, that were occupied between 1980 and 2006 to document this decline in the abundance of Grey Jays within Algonquin Park. Alternatively, Barrett et al. measured the cold tolerance of three-spine sticklebacks from marine and freshwater populations and found that they differed. Now here, this is a simple comparison between two sets of populations. The experimenter hasn't manipulated anything in this study. They've simply observed fish from two different scenarios and made comparisons between them. The other thing to point out is that the way in which Barrett et al measured cold tolerance in the sticklebacks was fairly invasive. They put the fish in a tank and slowly decreased the temperature until the fish wasn't able to maintain its body position and used that temperature as a measure of the cold tolerance of the fish. So although the measurement was quite invasive, 
The experimenters in this case haven't exposed some of the subjects to one treatment and other subjects to another treatment, so it's still an observational study. The third type of evidence that we'll talk about is experimental evidence. In an experiment, the researcher manipulates the conditions that some subjects are experiencing while leaving other subjects unmanipulated, representing our controls. And then the researcher collects data on both the experimental and the control subjects. These pictures are from the Cedar Creek ecosystem manipulation in which these different grassland plots were experimentally planted with different numbers of species and experienced different degrees of disturbance such as mowing to test some of the effects of biodiversity and disturbance on ecosystem productivity. Some plots experienced manipulations while others remained as controls. In a study that we performed with red squirrels, some populations of red squirrels were supplemented with additional food shown in red, while other populations shown in black were not fed and as a result remained as controls. Finally, Lancaster et al. manipulated the levels of estradiol in eggs of side blotched lizards to test the effects of this hormone on the back patterning of the offspring that developed from these eggs. So in this case, we have some individuals that received no manipulation and others for which uh, estradiol concentration was experimentally manipulated in their eggs to see how that affected their back patterning. Now I wanna give you one example to think carefully about and you can decide for yourself whether you think this represents an experiment or an observation. In a 2002 study, Turetsky et al. measured the carbon dioxide flux from bogs, internal lawns, and frost mounts. So what they did was to go out into the field and set up these chambers connected to some machines to collect air samples and analyze those samples using fancy machines that could tell them how much CO2 was coming out of the soil in these three scenarios, bogs, internal lawns, and frost mounts. So what I would like you to do is to think about this for yourself. Do you think this represents an experiment or an observational study? Although not a true experiment, it's worth briefly mentioning what is often called a natural experiment, where a very large, rare, or dramatic event can severely alter a particular ecosystem or population. Now these aren't real experiments in that the experimenter or the researcher has not manipulated the particular agent, but these are sometimes treated as evidence as though they were experiments. The rationale for treating these as though they were experiments is that the event is so severe that we expect the effects of that event to swamp out any other effects that might confound the differences between are areas that experienced the event and areas that did not. For example, Little et al. recently documented that tropical cyclones affect the natural selection on aggression in these social spiders. So what they did was to go out and try and predict where cyclones were going to hit to sample populations before and after the cyclones in places where the cyclones hit and where they did not. The trouble with natural experiments is that despite our best efforts, the treatments are not applied randomly by the experimenter. And as a result, we can never know for sure whether the effects that we're seeing were due to the thing that had changed as a result of the large natural event or whether they could in fact be confounded by some other factor. So we've already talked about how anecdotes are a particularly weak form of scientific evidence. But what about observations and experimentation? Do you think that observations are superior to experiments? Or perhaps that experiments are a superior form of evidence to observations? What I'd like you to do is to take some time and give this some thought, and perhaps to even record your thoughts and set those aside for some time. And we'll revisit this problem later on in our videos.